Our next speaker is Jamie Alexander. Jamie Alexander is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Cognitive Science. He is co-founder of several educational technology platforms, including this course, ESL Genie, and KA Light. His team at the Foundation for Learning Equality, which includes undergraduates, graduates, and faculty from UC San Diego, is leveraging technological solutions to improve global access to learning opportunities, especially within disadvantaged and isolated communities. Tonight, he'll share their plans for bridging the digital divide to make universal education truly universal by bringing the online learning revolution to the 65% of the world that is offline. Welcome, Jamie Alexander. Thanks, Lauren. I love to learn. As evidence of this, I've been in school for pretty much the last 25 years of my life. And over the course of my life, I've had access to the mentorship of fantastic teachers. I've had libraries full of books at my disposal. I've had supportive, well-educated parents. I have had access to a treasure trove of global knowledge via the internet. I have been incredibly lucky. Learning allows us to solve problems that we once thought were impossible. Learning allows us to gain new perspectives on the world and overcome our, our prejudices. And learning opens up opportunities and enables social and economic mobility. I have been incredibly lucky. But not everybody has these same learning opportunities. The world, unfortunately, is not a particularly equal place. But that's what we, the Foundation for Learning Equality, a nonprofit organization, grown, born and raised right here at UC San Diego, are trying to solve. So you may have heard that there's a revolution afoot. We've already heard about one revolution tonight, but there's a lot of buzz in the news and at the universities um, in this online learning revolution over the past several years in particular. And there are a lot of exciting components of this online learning revolution. Um, there are interesting pedagogical advances that they enable, such as um, mastery-based learning, where learners can work through materials more at their own pace rather than being grouped together and having to, to work through things at the exact same pace, uh, as well as being able to flip the classroom, be able to engage students in more active learning inside the classroom and have the lecturing components um, done on their own time through multimedia. But the part that really excites me about this online learning revolution is this idea that now, perhaps for the first time ever, we have the potential for ubiquitous education we can achieve greater reach and we can actually achieve equal access for educational resources. And this is firmly embedded in the mission statements of many of the major players in the online learning revolution. Um, Khan Academy, uh, where I was working summer of 2012, um, its mission statement is to enable a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And the way they're doing that, they have an online learning platform with over 4,000 videos on topics from math, through art history, through biology. And they're making that available through this platform. Students can engage with these videos as well as inter over 400 interactive exercises. They can track their progress, and teachers can and parents and mentors can engage with them, view their progress, and uh, use this for flipping the classroom for, so that students can work at their own pace. And, again, to achieve this mission of, of trying to reach everybody everywhere. Of course, there's something that all of this depends on. This is a picture from 2005 of the internet. I don't know if you've seen a picture of the internet before. But um, this network that connects us together is what is enabling, and the, the, the increase in broadband access through, particularly in the developed world, is what's really been enabling this revolution in online learning over the past several years. So for those of us who are here, we can literally now go online and learn just about anything at our own pace for free through this, uh, through this resource, through this network. But of course, there are some people who don't have access to this. In fact, uh, and, and these people then are blocked, blocked from accessing and, and engaging and, and learning, uh, and blocked from being a part of this global revolution um, that's underway. 
and it's two-thirds of the world that doesn't have access to these resources. That's a substantial portion of humanity. And it's not just that it's two-thirds of the world, it's specifically the two-thirds of the world that's most disadvantaged in other ways. If you look at, uh, if you break this out by country's uh, economic um, status, um, the lowest income countries have 6% internet penetration. And uh, at middle income up to 27% uh, as of uh, a couple of years ago. But if we, if we project that out, some people have said maybe within 10 years, internet will be more ubiquitous around the world. Um, that may be, I think that's optimistic, especially if we look at the lower income um, countries here and the growth curve. But even if in 10 years, internet will be ubiquitous, we're leaving generations behind who will not be able to benefit from these resources. And 10 years down the road, there'll be another digital divide that will be leaving them behind. So that's why we believe that we need to be proactive in reaching out and enabling equal access to these communities so that they'll, they can be more equipped to participate in the global learning revolution. And in particular, since there's this cycle, this negative cycle between lack of education and poverty, if we don't actively reach in and make these resources available, then we're going to be further perpetuating and increasing global divides. So especially here at an institution that's dedicated to enabling public access, outreach, and uh, making public education a reality, um, we, we had questions about how can we solve this problem? How can we remove these barriers and make education more accessible to the rest of the world? And so our current solution uh, that we've been working on at the Foundation for Learning Equality is taking Khan Academy and making it available offline. So through this, through this project, KA Light. So you may wonder, how can we take something that's so inherently online and make it available to communities that don't have access to this network? Well, it takes advantage of a number of things. We have slow connections into some of these areas that are closer to the, to the end destinations that we're trying to reach. So the content can be slowly downloaded and the software can be slowly downloaded to those locations and then carried on foot through the sneaker net to reach the final destination. And so it's, it's, it's kind of taking, you've heard a lot about cloud computing. Well, this is taking cloud computing and turning it into ground computing. So bringing things back, distributing the, the internet back out as it was originally intended um, so that it can be directly used in, in the, uh, right where the users are. And so once the materials and the software have reached these communities, we can use low cost or old uh, donated hardware to run a server in a classroom, in a home, in an orphanage, and have students be able to engage from client devices connecting to a server locally without needing any internet connectivity. And the teachers then can use this for doing things like flipping the classroom and for self-paced learning, uh, where the teacher can log in and view the student's progress and give feedback, and uh, students can track where they are in their learning trajectory. So we launched this project last December, and uh, in the course of the last 11 months, it's been picked up now in over 84 countries. So the software has been installed around the world. Each of these pins here is an installation of K-Lite that's pinging back to our central server uh, where the analytics is aggregated, and, um, which means that this is actually a subset. These are the installations of K-Lite at the time they were online, before they were then taken off and installed somewhere offline. Um, so this is a subset of the places that K-Lite is being used. And each of these pins here is an untold story most of these pins here are an untold story. But I wanted to share a few of the stories that have come back to us, and some of these we're working more closely with. Um, so I wanted to tell you a bit about how it's being used. One project that we're very excited about is in India with uh, students uh, using inexpensive tablets that are now being produced with a Wi-Fi server in the classroom to um, flip the classroom and engage with these materials and work at their own pace. In prisons, so outside of the classroom, there's a lot of exciting opportunities. In prisons here in the US, um, Edward is a prisoner in Washington State who had been in prison um, three times. This, he said this is now his last time uh, because he's now using these materials, gaining confidence, and moving on and developing new skills. Uh, and we now have uh, deployments across the state of Idaho in the Idaho Department of Correction. And in a pilot in the summer, um, every each of the 20 students in a program using K Lite for the first time passed their math GED, um, which was something they hadn't seen before. And uh, interestingly, in an orphanage in Cameroon, so they some people took donated laptops and set it up in the in the 
um, orphanage there. And it was originally intended for the children in the orphanage, but teachers and other community members actually started visiting the orphanage and using it as a community learning center. So it enabled a new type of, of learning. So I wanted to just highlight, when I, when I first came to UC San Diego, I didn't have this on my trajectory. I was, I was hoping that the research I did would have impact but, uh, and, and be translational, but I didn't realize that I would be helping to start a nonprofit organization that would be reaching people around the world. So I wanted to just, uh, first of all, highlight some of the people here today, this awesome community of people making this happen. Uh, if you're part of FLE or involved in some of this, these projects, just give a quick shout or put your hand up. <laughs> awesome. Um, so this includes undergraduates, graduate students, alumni, as well as deans and faculty members. So I think this really embodies Tritons United, the spirit of Tritons United, um, where we have a diverse group of people coming together to solve global problems with very different skill sets, very different um, backgrounds, and um, solving a global problem as a community. And that's what's been really exciting about this for me. So we've only just begun. k -Light is the first step on our trajectory to enabling equal learning around the world. And we'd like to invite you to get involved. This is a, a wide, distributed, collaborative effort. So if you'd like to get involved or learn how you can support our efforts, then talk to us afterwards. As you can see, there are a lot of people here. We'll have them hold up their cards so you can see who's involved, so you can talk to us afterwards. And, uh, or check us out. Visit us at learningequality.org. Thank you.